Hello and welcome Hi, everybody. Um, we're going to start this webinar. Um, we've had a little uh, issue with the uh, audio for our speaker. Um, she can give the presentation, but she cannot hear us, which um, is not a big problem, but um, uh, we, can, we can work it out. Um, you can see her and we, you can hear her, so that's no problem. Um, my name is Eve Silver and I work for Wetlands International. Uh, and I would like to um, uh, briefly for the people new here and who haven't been able to uh, attend previous sessions to um, tell you that we are recording this session so you can watch it also later on. Um, the link will be provided on the Wetlands International European Association website. Um, the presenter will be giving a talk for up to an hour and then after uh, one hour you can uh, ask questions and we will use the chat function for this in the uh, panel on the right. Um, we will collect those questions and Laura will answer them. Uh, we will close this session about an hour and a half from now. So uh, please enjoy the talk. I will now give the floor to Bruno Bocce, who works for the Italian Center of River Restoration to introduce um, this webinar further. Thank you, Bruno, up to you. Okay, thank you, Alpha, and uh, welcome to everybody, both the one who are connected this morning and uh, also to the newcomers. Um, this uh, web seminar will be on dam removal step by step, uh, part two. The part one was uh, on this morning. Uh, I'm uh, Bruno Botz, and uh, uh, I represent uh, the Italian Center for River Restoration. Uh, we are a non-profit association uh, dealing with uh, uh, and promoting river restoration in Italy and uh, in uh, Europe. And we are part, we are member of Wetland International European Association. And we are very pleased to, to have the chance to organize this cycle of uh, seminars uh, dealing with different issues uh, uh, on river restoration. Um, Coming to this uh, seminar, I'm uh, pleased to introduce uh, uh, the speaker of this afternoon, which is Laura Weilman. Uh, she is the director of the New England Regional Office and Fishery Engineer for Princeton Hydro, which is a company, U.S. company, um, dealing uh, and providing integrated uh, ecological engineering consulting services. Uh, and uh, she's considered the one of the most important experts in the uh, USA uh, concerning uh, fish uh, passing and uh, uh, dam removal. So um, we have the possibility to err from air uh, very technical uh, indication concerning dam removal. Um, for example, the critical phases uh, uh, during dam removal projects, uh, um, the feasibility uh, actions, sediment analysis, for example, which is a, a very uh, important topic on, on dam removal, and also uh, how to monitor and uh, uh, which kind of adaptive management we have to, to follow after the, the removal. Uh, of course, uh, she will uh, present uh, a number of uh, case studies, um, I think uh, uh, mainly from USA, but uh, considering that uh, now she's also um, working in, in England for her PhD, probably uh, she will give us also some indication from Europe. So, Laura. Mm, the floor is yours, and uh, thanks again to accept uh, to be speaker today, and, and thanks uh, for being here. Okay, okay, I couldn't hear him well, so I couldn't tell if I was supposed to start. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, great. Great, okay, hello everyone. Sorry that we have a little bit of uh, technical difficulties on my end. I can't hear any audio, so I am um, gonna connect by cell phone as needed uh, for the questions and answers section. 
Um, my name is Laura Wildman. I'm a professional engineer. I'm a fisheries and water resource engineer with a company called Princeton Hydro. We're an ecological restoration firm and primarily I work on the removal of dams. I've worked on Oh, probably around 200 uh, dam removal projects across the country at this point, um, many of which have already um, been removed. Um, I've been working in dam removal for the last uh, 20 years uh, as a form of river restoration, primarily for uh, migratory fish restoration. Today, um, this is the second part of a talk. Um, on dam removal, step by step. Um, the first part of the talk was done by Pow earlier, about six hours earlier than this. Hopefully a lot of you got a chance to see that. She ran through more of some of the drivers, uh, some of the critical issues, um, and then went through the different countries and kind of what's going on and what the regulatory framework is like in these different countries. So I won't be hitting any of that, on my talk, I'm going to stick to um, talking a little bit about some of the impacts of dams and the impacts of dam removal, what we manage for, and then how we analyze dams for removal. And then I'm going to go through a bunch of different case studies um, from primarily here in the United States um, to kind of show these examples of the different issues associated with dam removal, the critical issues that come up. So we're gonna start with the impacts of dams and the impacts of dam removal as well. And to start discussing that, we need to talk about some of the issues associated with a free flowing river. Um, so a free flowing river has obviously a natural stream bed features and substrate and habitat that has evolved over a long period of time along with the species in that system. It has turbulent flow patterns, uh, it has a natural temperature regime, again, that the species in the system have adapted to, um, and a natural flow regime. Um, you have natural transport of sediments, so rivers transport both water and sediment naturally, and when that's thrown off balance, uh, the river itself is thrown off balance. Rivers also transport debris and nutrients down the system from the watershed. And obviously aquatic organism um, passage both upstream, downstream into the tributaries, that connectivity in a natural river system. And, and when I say that connectivity, it isn't totally fluid. Obviously there are natural things like um, natural grade breaks, waterfalls, um, beaver dams. So there's connectivity, but within, you know, still a system that has a lot of complexity and diversity. And when you put a dam on a river, um, some of the first things that, uh, that happen is first of all, on, especially on larger dams, you end up stratifying the reservoir. This changes the water quality and temperature. So you see changes in temperature, whether it's stratified or not, even on a shallow impoundment that's not stratified, you get increases in water temperature within the impoundment, increased evaporation within the reservoir. These impacts then are distributed downstream. So you see changes in the, the water temperatures downstream, and that will depend, it will be warmer or colder depending on what the release is like, if it's a surface or bottom release. You get changes in water quality, especially within reservoirs, you tend to get lower um, decreased water quality levels, um, uh, decreased dissolved oxygen levels, you might get algae blooms associated with them. And these decreases in water quality, again, are distributed downstream, so you get decreased water quality downstream of the dam typically as well. The dams themselves block that debris and nutrients. Um, of course, some of that material will flush over, but we still get a lot of accumulation within the reservoir and a shortage of that material downstream of a dam. And as I said, with rivers transporting both water and sediment, we end up blocking the sediment. And this is one of the largest impacts, obviously, of a dam. Um, that you block the sediment behind the dam and you often create a situation down below the dam that becomes sediment starved or what we call a clear water condition where the river in an effort to make up for that balance of sediment and water 
starts eating away at the river banks and the river bed, and you can get degradation of the stream bed downstream of a dam. This is especially noticeable in larger uh, dams, but you can see it in small dams too if the system is sensitive enough. Um, you can get coarsening of that stream bed material downstream. And of course, dams block the free movement of aquatic organisms, um, and not just fish species, but mussels and vertebrates. So when we look at this from this chart uh, from 1984, I think this one um, explains the effects of barriers pretty well, looking at first order impacts, second order impacts, and third order impacts. So you have the barrier itself, and the first order impacts relate to water quality, changes in hydrology, and sediment load. And then those impacts that a dam has created, therefore, start impacting the second order. Uh, the second order impacts come around. Um, primary production and morphology of the channel starts to change. And then you get the third order impacts, which are the impacts to uh, invertebrates, fish, birds, mammals, both in the aquatic um, setting and the terrestrial setting that is dependent on the aquatic organisms. I often liken putting a dam on a river to holding a, an American eel. Um, it's going to continually fight you. The river is going to continually fight you. You're trying to hold the river in one location, and a river doesn't want to do that. A river wants to be dynamic and mobile, much like the eel here. So as this eel is wrapping himself around and fighting us from holding him here, uh, the river is going to do the same thing over time. It's why maintenance on dams becomes such a critical issue. Another impact of dams uh, is, is less the impact of environmental, but the increased dam safety risk, the increased um, risk that come with a dam. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that a dam is a man-made feature that can breach. Um, and, it can, and it can release that water within the reservoir, sometimes catastrophically. So we talk about this in the dam safety arena as a dam breach inundation zone. And we have models where we can figure out what that dam breach inundation zone is. You see one here from this small dam upstream. And what happens in that dam breach inundation zone? You might have people in this low-lying area that would be affected by flooding, maybe flooding their houses or their garages. You see them sandbagging here after a dam failure in Iowa. But you can also have people in that constricted area that some dams have right below the dam. And homes in these areas, homes and businesses in these areas, if they're in a constricted area when the flood wave comes through, can be at risk for loss of life as well. So this is the kind of thing we calculate um, when we construct a dam so that we understand the risks associated with it. Uh, interestingly enough, though, in the United States, there's not a requirement to tell people who live within dam breach inundation zones. Some municipalities do this um, out of a courtesy and for preparedness, but not all communities do that and there's no um, state or federal laws that require notifying people. Now, we talk about impacts of dams, but we also need to talk about impacts of dam removal. Uh, while, while dams had an initial impact, removing a dam also has an impact on the system. And much of a dam removal project is managing for these impacts of dam removal. So we've run through some of those. One of the biggest ones we deal with are issues associated with geomorphic stability and infrastructure. So we take the dam out and we're obviously going to start mobilizing sediment. Uh, we're going to start changing the morphology of the system. And if infrastructure has gone in since the dam has been put in place, we're often going to see impacts to that infrastructure that we have to manage for, like upstream bridges, as I show here. Now, this is all part of dealing with the impounded sediment, but we also have to deal with impounded sediment relating to uh, quantity and quality of the sediment moving downstream as well, and what kind of impacts that's going to have on the system downstream and how we might manage for that. And then sensitivity of the downstream system is going to make a big difference. Are there sensitive species downstream, like mussels or sensitive fish species? Are there invasive species downstream that are currently blocked by the dam 
that if we took the dam out would move upstream? Or is there sensitivity associated with things like flooding of infrastructure that has gone in downstream since the dam was put in? And then we also have issues to deal with relating to the current use of the dam. Um, this can be anything from recreational use, water supply, uh, flood control, but what we're seeing a lot of uh, across the globe right now, especially when I'm working outside of the United States, is balancing issues associated with hydro and environmental impacts and determining when we need hydro or when we want to maintain or renew hydro um, and when the environmental impacts might be too great. We're, we're trying to balance these issues. We also deal with issues associated with historic and sentimental value, and we're going to go into examples of all these later in the talk here. And then I wrote down unknowns here because there are certain things that come up that still continually surprise me, even after 20 years of removing dams. So it's important to remember that we can't predict everything. So first, we're just going to run through analysis of dams. So basically, a standard project. And when I run through a project like this, I want to make it clear that most of the dams I work on are 10 meters or lower. Um, so they're smaller structures. Um, some might refer to them as weirs. Um, some are small dams. So it's kind of a variety. But most of what I work on are these smaller structures. And there's kind of a repeated pattern of how we do the analysis on these projects. And I'm going to go through that here for you. First of all, step one, we start with planning and feasibility phase. Now, the engineers might be involved in this phase, or it might just be project partners working on this, and they might bring us in at a certain part of it. The first is selecting the project itself. A lot of projects are selected opportunistically. Let's say because a decision point needs to be made uh, on the dam. There's a decision point that, that, that's come up, such as um, a state dam safety office sending a notice of violation, and now you need to decide if you're going to repair or remove the dam. So that might be one opportunistic type thing. You might also run into opportunistic things where a dam has been abandoned, but there would be environmental impact, um, environmental benefit, sorry, to removing the dam. Uh, and then you have the more advanced prioritization and optimization methods where you're really trying to maximize connectivity of a system and determine where the best options are for removal. And we've seen a lot of these globally now. We've got a bunch in the United States and a bunch elsewhere uh, where they've really worked on these um, prioritization or better yet optimization plans uh, for removal. Once we've selected a project and determined um, if we have any funding options for that project, we need to identify project goals for that project. Are we doing this for fish passage? Are we trying to reduce dam safety issues? Are we trying to improve water quality? There can be a variety of reasons we might be talking about removing a dam. And in the United States especially, we need to ask, will the dam owner consider removal? The majority of dams in the United States are privately owned. Um, so no one is going to be able to remove a dam in the United States without the dam owner's consent. So if the dam owner is not interested in removal, you might have to, to try to reach some of those goals you were looking to do, you might have to look at other options. Uh, lowering the dam or putting a fishway in or repairing and placing, replacing it if the dam safety is your issue. If the dam owner is on board, this is the time you really want to identify the key issues. Now, I've got a very long checklist I use. It's about three pages long, and I'm not going to go into that, but I'm going to go into just some of the key issues on that checklist. So, and we'll talk about these in the case studies too, but here's some of the top key issues. Sediment issues, infrastructure, we've talked about these uh, earlier too. Utilities, utility crossings, current uses, environmental concerns and benefits, that geomorphic equilibrium we were talking about early, uh, public health and safety, flooding and hydrologic impacts, aesthetic and sentimental, historic and archeological, community concerns, sensitive or invasive species, 
And then water rights, does, does one person own the dam or does someone else own the water rights to the system? And then of course, cost and available funding. And again, this list is quite a bit more extensive than this, and there's a lot of things under each one of these, but this is just kind of a, a quick list. Once we've identified some of those key issues on the project, and actually in the process of identifying those, we wanna collect as much available data for the site as possible. Um, in the United States, there's a lot of data online for different dams and river systems. Um, and I think abroad as well, um, we're seeing a lot of this data being collected too. For example, one of the things we check is threatened and endangered species databases online. We look at infrastructure and utilities that are at risk and try to get mapping and plans for these structures <clears throat> to figure out how at risk they are. We try to gather information on the historic and ar archeological issues. I like to look at aerial photographs, especially over time. This is an example of the Hemingway Pond and we'll see this one. This one's supposedly gonna be removed this up and coming year. Um, we'll see this one talked about later in the case studies, but from looking at the aerial photos, it taught me a few things. It showed me that this was likely an excavated pond, that the channel was likely in a different location previously, and that a coarse grain sediment delta had deposited rather rapidly since 1970 and infilled the excavated portion of the pond. During this initial part of the planning and feasibility, we want to get stakeholder information too. Because even when you think you've identified all the key issues, it's not until you start having some of those stakeholder and public meetings where you really can make sure that you are starting to incorporate and address all the issues. Then you're gonna go out and do a field investigation. Uh, this is gonna center a lot on, on the dam itself, the utilities and the infrastructure, but also on a geomorphic assessment of that system and environmental assessment, obviously, as well. So here's just some pictures of us going out doing some investigations, measuring a dam there, uh, doing sediment probes uh, behind another dam. That sediment investigation becomes quite critical um, what we're looking to do during the sediment investigation, I think I have some other pictures here. Um, we're looking to determine the physical characteristics of the sediment. Is it coarse grain? Is it fine grain? Is it cohesive, non-cohesive? We're looking to figure out the quantity of sediment, how much impounded sediment is there, and what portion of that impounded sediment might be mobile. Um, and we're looking to um, do some testing to figure out the quality of the sediment as well. So we take samples from different layers within the impoundment in different locations, focusing primarily on the fine grain sediments um, for testing and compare that to background levels in the system. We're also concerned with the configuration of the sediment. So, you know, where have the sediment deposits, where haven't they deposited? This will be different per dam. And if we can dewater uh, the reservoir during that um, period of time, it's a very helpful way to determine that configuration. We're also at this early stage starting our consultation with the regulators, especially relating to what they wanna see for sediment investigation. Now we ask ourselves, are there any showstoppers after we've gone through all these things? If there are showstoppers, we might have to go back to considering other alternatives such as repair, replacement, lowering, or a fish web. If there aren't any obvious showstoppers, now we can um, start looking into an alternatives analysis that's more about the dam removal options um, and the alternatives for dam removal than some of those other alternatives with less ecological benefit. Again, at all phases of this, we're looking to secure additional funding. Most of these projects have funding sources patched together. You might have initial funding for planning and feasibility, but at this point, we're also gonna need um, funding for the design and permitting. We're gonna develop a sediment management plan even at this early phase because it's gonna start giving us some ideas of what the potential cost might be for these projects, which is all part of feasibility. So we're gonna be looking at options such as passive release of the sediment, letting it go downstream on its own, or a staged release of sediment, or, or excavation of the sediment and either relocation of on-site or off-site, or a combination of methods. And again, we're gonna consult with the regulators during this process 
And we're going to use that information we had from our sediment investigation to determine, first of all, on the quantity, can the system downstream handle a release of sediment? If it can, then we're going to look into the passive release option, um, especially if the system is sediment starved downstream. If it can't handle, if the system is too sensitive or the infrastructure that will be impacted by releasing that sediment downstream, then we're going to start looking at these other options, the stage release, the excavation, or the combination of method. From a quality point of view, if the sediment is of similar quality to background levels or lower, um, again, the passive release option might be a good option for us. If it is not, if it is more contaminated within the impoundment than the background levels in the system, then again, we are likely going to have to be looking at options relating to excavation, some kind of combination of methods. At, during the planning and feasibility phase, we already had some stakeholder input, but again, at the end, we want to kind of get back to people and let them know what our findings were at the beginning, get people's input again. It's all part of an educational process um, and a learning pro uh, that goes both ways, us learning about the community and their needs and them learning more about the process and the issues associated with dams. One of the things I like to use in meetings like that at the beginning before the dam has been taken out is photo renderings. So the example you see right there is a photo rendering. Um, the dam above, that's a picture with the dam in, and the dam hadn't been taken out yet, um, but we wanted to show them what it might look like. And this particular one, based on our probes, we realized had a waterfall back behind the dam. So we were, um, we were showing what this site might look like without the dam. And this is going to be very, very helpful when talking to the community at the beginning stages. The next phase is this design and permitting phase. Um, so one of the first things you want to do is go out and um, delineate the regulated resources. Now these can be wetland issues, uh, edge of water issues, sensitive flora fauna. We might have to do ecological inventories and studies at this point, especially if we have sensitive species or rare and endangered species that we have to protect. We're going to start conducting our surveys. This can include a topographic survey bathymetric survey, cross-sections, profiles, um, and then uh, surveying in those delineated resources and preparation of a base map. Sometimes we also include monumenting some of the cross-sections and the profile, um, specifically the cross-sections, and then we can recreate the profile through that, um, especially for long-term monitoring. So if we have something like this, here's an example of a project where we had LIDAR for a lot of our topographic work. Uh, and what we really needed on here were uh, in-channel cross-sections um, such that we could do the hydro hydrologic and hydraulic modeling of the system, specifically the hydraulic modeling. Based on our survey information and our additional field delineations, um, we might refine our sediment management approach. It's a kind of a constant process throughout the project. We're going to be running our hydrologic and hydraulic analysis, and that is also going to feed into um, our sediment management analysis. We might have, uh, typically we have something like a HECRAS water surface profile model done for the system. Uh, we often have a hydrologic model as well that determines if there's any attenuation associated with the dam, will there be any risk to increased flooding downstream, uh, what will be the change in water surface elevations, um, and what will be the change in stresses uh, in the river system and on infrastructure. Uh, we also, um, and that down below here you see uh, one of our base plans, again showing the cross sections and in that case showing proposed conditions. We prepare plans and report that describes the design in detail such that we can go through the permitting process we come up with the construction costs and specifications for the project. And again, we integrate stakeholder and public meetings in this process. As I said, this is all tied to reassessing continually um, the approach and what we're going to be doing with the sediment. And it's also integrated with the permitting and consultation with the regulators, at least here in the United States. And our regulatory process, I'm not going to go through this whole chart, basically can be bro broken down into three categories. 
we have often have uh, local requirements, local permits that need to be met. We have state requirements based on federal laws um, that regulate things like dam safety and wetlands and species of concern and flooding. Uh, and then we have um, federal requirements um, that some of those are covered under the state regulatory process, but we also have some federal permits. Most typically we have an Army Corps of Engineers permit looking again at um, uh, wetland systems, but also coordinating with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and EPA um, to also look at issues like water quality and um, species of concern and fish passage. So once we've obtained the permits, which can be a, a, a long process, uh, we get into the next stage of construction. Uh, this might start with a bidding process unless it's a design build type of a project. Um, and it might start with ordering materials uh, very quickly so that we can stay on schedule for construction and then securing additional funding for monitoring. We have oversight of the construction typically by the design team to ensure consistency with the design and with the permits. Uh, there you just see uh, a removal that's going on. Uh, that's during construction there. And then after construction, we typically have a regulatory sign off that we need to do to make sure that everything in the permits was completed. And then we have step four, which is monitoring and adaptive management. Often there are requirements in the permitting process for some type of monitoring. And I typically like to incorporate adaptive management into the design such that you ensure that you're meeting your project goals. So again, we get into monitoring and then adaptive management and then repeat as necessary till the project is complete. For a monitoring point of view, there is a good guideline that was written a few years back um, called the Stream Barrier Removal Monitoring Guide, specifically for dam removal. And it creates a, basically a skeletal structure of cross sections and a profile, and then monitors things like longitudinal profile, grain size distribution, you have photo stations, you look at water quality, riparian plant, community structure, macroinvertebrates, and fish assemblages. Now we're going to run into um, the case studies with our, our remaining time here. So we're going to go through a lot of those things that I discussed at the beginning as far as impacts of dam removal and how to uh, address those. I want to make it clear from the beginning that there are no two dam removals that are the same. There are some that are more similar than others, but no two that are the same. Every dam, there is a variety of types of dams, and depending on the type of dam, whether it's a concrete dam or an earthen dam or a stone masonry dam, how you remove it is going to vary. Also, there's different uses of the dam, and if you're trying to maintain some of these uses, and balance those in the project it can get quite challenging. There's all different types of uses that we're balancing or needing to deal with the fact that they will be removed and maybe need to be replaced somewhere else. Then we have a wide variety of site-specific issues, too many to ever go over in one talk. But for example, we will talk about some of these in the case studies. Is the, is the dam on a canal and not really a river? Is the Impoundment wide or narrow? Are you in an urban or rural area? Is the system highly managed? And we could just continue to go on. Is there any kind of legacy fallway or historic issues or legacy dam even behind the, the dam that exists there? And then there's issues associated with the impacts themselves, the sensitivity of the system, the species that are in the system, how entrenched the system is, its transport capacity, social perception, and the scale of the project amongst others that I've listed here. So if we jump into some of the geomorphic stability and in infrastructure issues on some case studies, you'll kind of see the diversity of what we're talking about. First of all, on a real simple dam removal project, and of course there are a lot of these very simple dam removal projects, where we come in and we've got impounded sediment behind the dam, we've got the dam in place as you see in some kind of scour hole, and then you have some kind of pre-dam profile, the, the river profile before the dam was put in. 
And you can probe down to that. You can kind of determine where that consolidated material is, not the impounded sediment. And then if you remove the dam, uh, you start mobilizing the impounded sediment. If you haven't removed it ahead of time, if you haven't excavated, this is if you're doing a passive transport, you start getting a head cut or nick point moving upstream. You fill in the scour hole downstream. That sediment moves downstream and then you get the head cut extending upstream until basically all of the impounded sediment, the mobile portion of the impounded sediment has been transported downstream. And you've looked at the downstream transport issues to determine where that's going to drop out and where, what's going to happen to that. But of course, there are many, many examples that don't follow such a simple pattern. Uh, here's the Teleelectric Dam in Massachusetts. This is one that's under investigation right now. And as you can see by these photos, there's a significant amount of infrastructure at this site. There are three railroad bridges upstream, two of which are active, directly upstream. Um, there's one that is um, inactive, the one that's closest to the dam itself there. Um, there are other bridges, uh, road crossings upstream. There are buildings adjacent. There are foundations that have to be dealt with. And the dam itself even connects to the old mill building. So on a site like this, it's extremely important to understand um, the depths of impounded sediment. And then what is the consistency of that underlying riverbed? And is it even the original underlying riverbed? Um, and will it stay in place once the dam is taken out? Will just the impounded sediment move or might we actually even cut into the underlying material depending on how much has changed at this site? And what are those footings like on that infrastructure and how might we be impacting this? On this particular project, we knew nothing about the depths of the footings on the infrastructure. So that's the phase that they're at right now, looking into that investigation. Here's another example, the Goldsboro Dam. This one was removed a while ago, back in 2001, but it had significant channel degradation below the dam. So basically there had been a head cut, some change in base level elevation downstream, and a head cut had extended all the way to the dam itself. Now removing the dam meant that not just the impounded sediment was going to move, but that you were gonna be cutting into the original riverbed material as well, and potentially unraveling the system. They had an upstream bridge that they were concerned with, <coughs> so this was a problem. The solution in this case for them was to put all these small weirs in place. I wonder in the long run though, if they hadn't created maybe an, a, a larger maintenance issue than even the dam itself. Um, although it does look like their, their primary alternative um, objective on this one was probably fish passage. So they might have gotten fish passage for a certain type of species, but they surely have not gotten rid of a, a long-term maintenance uh, problem here. The Green Rivers Dam in Massachusetts, this is an interesting project, a series of two dams we were asked to come and do final design for. Um, everyone had assumed that removing these dams would be okay, but when we started to do our geomorphic investigation, we realized that the system was much more sensitive than we had thought, and, and removing the dams was going to potentially have more significant impacts to infrastructure upstream than we had thought. One of the real interesting things about this dam, it, neither of these have come out, but what it looks like from our investigation is that the channel had had an avulsion. More or less, there had been a meander bend that had cut off before the dam was put in place. So, and the channel, the riverbed was still adjusting to that channel avulsion by having a, a head cut extend upstream of the avulsion um, before the dam was put in place. And then the dam was put in place and the backwater created by the dam basically halted that channel head cut from the avulsion. So now removal of the dam was not only gonna mobilize impounded sediment, it was likely going to reactivate that head cut caused by the channel avulsion that had happened you know, over a hundred years ago. So that caused a problem because there are a lot of new infrastructure had come in that could be impacted by that kind of unraveling of the system. 
This is the Hemingway Dam in Connecticut. We're working on this one actively right now, hoping to get to removal. I had mentioned this one earlier um, because we looked at the historic photos of this one. Uh, this is, is an interesting site because it was an excavated impoundment. So the original river went kind of around. It's on the northern part of this picture, or at least the upper part of this picture. Um, and now the channel went into this excavated pond and then filled with sediment, and that's what you're seeing here. Now the issue with removing a dam on a pond that has been excavated is again, you have the potential post dam removal to actually not just mobilize impounded sediment, but to potentially even head cut into original substrate. So in this case, we're looking to reutilize the old channel and not the excavated pool area such that we can maintain um, the, the grade on this system. Now, consecutive dams in a row are an interesting issue too. I mean, when you have a project with consecutive dam removals like the Naugatuck dams that we removed, the Naugatuck River dams in the 1990s, um, you can have enormous amount of environmental benefit and reopen an entire system. So these can be wonderful projects. And in the case of the Naugatuck dam removals, um, you really, here, here's pictures of them removed, but you really got a reinvigoration of a river that had been an industrial river, highly, highly dammed to one that now people are starting to much more actively use for recreation and fisheries. But the Naugatuck River, um, was a little bit easier a case of a multiple dam removal because they were spread out in a way that the removal of one did not impact the next dam upstream. So basically, the dams themselves, when you're looking at this water surface profile here, had a, a, a limited impoundment that went up, but then there was a free-flowing river stretch before you got to the next dam. So removing these dams all together um, was, was very feasible and easy to do, and the river quickly restored itself. But what I'm seeing more and more, especially as we um, start looking at dam removal throughout Europe, is that many of the rivers in Europe are really no longer rivers. They're more canals. They've been so highly manipulated, relocated, and straightened and managed. This is a picture to the right of um, the Netherlands. You can see this canal going down where they've, they've straightened it. And who knows what the original channel configuration was, but the channel is likely no longer in that, or at least large portions of it are no longer in it. And then if you dam a system like this, you have cascading impacts. So let's say you just wanted to remove one of the dams that we're looking at here. And these are actually all on different systems, but let's pretend they're all on one system. And you wanted to remove one of these, you'd have to be very careful, um, or two of these, you'd have to be very careful about how that might impact the next dam upstream or undermine that or head cut up to that point. Um, these are highly managed systems and a lot of times the water surface elevation is controlled um, uh, uh, in a very detailed way. So removing a dam in a system like this is um, uh, far more complex and you might actually have to look at restoration of the river channel as well. Here's just another example. <clears throat> this one, a lock system here. But again, where you can see that one dam after the next would, would affect. So if you were trying to take out just one of these barriers in this system, obviously that would affect the entire management system. So again, a channelized river versus a natural river, there's some significant differences and removal on a system like this might mean having to look at uh, de-channelizing um, the river as part of your removal project. An example of that here in the Netherlands, um, we see where there had been a canal river <coughs> and they basically filled in the canal. You can see the dam down to the bottom right here. You see the dam that is basically in the filled in canal, no longer acting as a dam. And then they redesigned an entire channel system through this valley here. Uh, the interesting thing is the systems are so manipulated in the Netherlands 
that the water from this system isn't even coming from this watershed. It's actually pumped 12 feet uphill from a different watershed. So they're obviously not restoring the, the natural system as it once was, but trying to recreate some kind of ecological value here, having a lot of water quality issues associated with utilization of water from a different watershed. So we talk about passive and active uh, restoration of, of rivers post dam removal. This is um, an example of an active site restoration after dam removal. It's a small dam in Florida done by others. Uh, the Nature Conservancy was involved in this and shared these photos. Um, so when they took out the dam, they could have just allowed the channel to um, create itself, but in this case, and I wasn't involved in the project, so I don't know the reasonings, they decided instead to very actively manage the um, channel that was forming through the impoundment. They basically created a sinuous channel and then uh, stabilized the banks and did kind of um, a lot of plannings associated with that. Maybe this was because there was sediment that they did couldn't allow to go downstream or, um, or a sensitive species in the system. But another example showing passive uh, site restoration would be the Tannery Brook uh, dam removal that we did up in New Hampshire. This was about um, an 8.5 meter high earthen dam, so pretty significant size as far as a small dam goes. Very wide impoundment. Uh, we were removing the dam primarily for uh, safety reasons. The dam owner no longer wished to own this dam. Um, but we didn't do anything within the impoundment. So we took the dam out, and now you can see the impoundment dewatered there, and you can see that a channel has started to form. Actually, that channel started to form exactly where the legacy channel existed. And we could tell that because of the roots and how they were forming at an angle going out, the roots that were left there, the, the, um, the cut off trees, how they were forming at an angle as they had been uh, stream bank um, uh, trees at one time. So we allowed the channel just to form itself. It looked like a large mud flat for, for um, probably a few months and quickly revegetated after this. This is with no manipulation, no seeding. You can see the impoundment revegetated. See different angles of the impoundment here. Uh, the natural substrates were exposed. A lot of the complexity and diversity of this system, the large woody debris was exposed and the, the site was allowed to restore itself uh, passively and the sediment was released downstream. And there wasn't a lot of sediment in this impoundment. It was a relatively new dam. Now, passive site restoration at a large scale has happened in America too, but much less frequently. Um, when we're talking about really large quantities of sediment, it is the rare example where the regulators are going to allow a large release of sediment downstream. And you can only do it in a kind of more remote areas where there are, isn't a lot of infrastructure downstream that's gonna be impacted as well. But there are some examples in America. Uh, the big one, some of the big ones that I'm sure you've heard of were the Condit Dam Removal, where they blew up the dam on the, the bottom part of the dam, allowed enormous amount of very fine grain material actually to move downstream through this system rather rapidly. Um, and I have been out to visit this site since, and the, the system is very steep. It moved that sediment very quickly within about the first year um, through the system and down out to the larger river that it confluenced with. Um, and the system is, is responding quite well now, uh, but obviously there was tremendous um, uh, short-term impacts. Another example is the Glines Canyon and Elwa Dam systems. Again, large scale removals where they allowed the sediment to move downstream, completely inundating the downstream uh, river, submerging any habitats that were there. But the research being done on these is showing that again, we're not only getting reformation of a delta um, out as it confluences with the ocean there, but we're getting um, a rejuvenation of the entire system and, um, and these species coming back in and repopulating that system rather rapidly. Of course, you can't do this with contaminated sediment. So on contaminated sediment, um, here's some examples. The, the Milltown Dam removal in Montana, I wasn't involved in this project, 
but it's a well-known one for contaminants. This was basically a super fun site. Um, the sediment was so contaminated that the uh, water supply, the uh, groundwater for the town that was adjacent to this site was becoming contaminated. Um, the removal of this dam ended up being very, very expensive because of this. The sediments had to be managed. They had to be relocated or stabilized on site before the dam could be removed. Another example in Cumberland Dam in Maryland, uh, this dam still hasn't come out because during the investigation, it was determined that there were dioxins in the sediment. We had initially thought the largest expense associated with this dam removal was gonna be to modify the water intake for historic canal. But once dioxins were found, the concern was that the dioxins in the sediment and management of those dioxins was gonna be um, cost prohibitive and they're still investigating this particular project. Sensitivity of the system, as I mentioned, this can be sensitive species like mussels, which tend to um, be very sensitive to dam removals because they cannot relocate quickly. Um, this is a tiny little dam, only one meter high stone dam in Connecticut, no sediments behind it basically, but because there was a threatened mussel species downstream, it took us three years to permit uh, this removal and yet only 10 minutes to actually do the removal itself once we had relocated the species. Other examples of sensitivity on, on systems relate to invasive species that may have came in since the dam was put in place. I heard uh, this example recently described in a conference on the Rouge River uh, Dam in Michigan. And this one was removed specifically for connectivity issues and to benefit native fish species. <clears throat> and yet there was an invasive species downstream, the round goby, that came in and repopulated upstream habitats after the dam was removed and started out competing the native Johnny Darter, and they saw a decreased Johnny Darter populations after this removal. So invasive species have to be something that's really strongly considered when you're looking at dam removal, especially if your entire goal is to benefit the ecosystem through removal. Other potential downstream sensitivities, as I mentioned before, are things like flooding. Two examples that we've already mentioned earlier, one, the Hemingway Pond, that was the excavated one we were talking about before. That had a, a zero tolerance for sediment transport downstream because of flooding. They included about six foot of flooding in a facility downstream that built uh, fire trucks. Um, so basically the design had to incorporate um, stabilization of the sediment on site such that we had no movement of sediment downstream from that removal. The tannery dam that we mentioned before as an example of passive dam removal also had um, the ability to attenuate floods, even though it wasn't meant to be a flood control dam, it had been built in a way that acted to attenuate floods. So we had to look at the downstream system, but luckily there was a large wetland system downstream that also had the ability to attenuate. Um, so we were able to remove that dam and allow the wetland system downstream to handle the attenuation. I'm gonna to try to go through these a little quicker so we have time for questions and answers. But again, globally right now and in the United States, we are also seeing this balancing of hydro and environmental impacts. Um, I just gave some talks down in Brazil where they're building a lot of dams, but we're still open to have me come down there and talk about dam removal at the same time. Um, so there really is a, kind of a balance we all need to think about. The Edwards Dam in, in the United States was one of the very first, high, actually the only hydropower dam that was required to be removed by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission um, because it was creating more environmental damage than good. And then after it was removed, we saw um, the restoration of millions of alewife into the system as well as other species. Um, also up in Maine as well, the Penobscot River dams, um, we were part of a large uh, FERC, that's the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission settlement process in which they were trying to balance these hydro and environmental issues. And what they came up with, since this is a, a bifurcated system, so you had um, a main stem channel that then bifurcated and then came back together. 
They basically increased hydro production on dams on one of the stems of the river and then removed dams on the other stem of the river and, and created additional fish passage as well. So this was a really a win-win example where they were able to get two dams removed, open up large sections of the river for um, migratory fish and resident fish, um, and still increase um, power production. <coughs> Here's pictures of those two dams, uh, both before their removal and after removal. Another interesting thing is they both had large legacy dams back behind. So basically dams that existed prior to the dam that was in place now that also had to be addressed uh, when removing the other dams. So we removed the primary dam, but then we had to go in and also make uh, holes and breaches in these legacy dams to get the, um, the final results, the uh, connectivity results that they were hoping for. The Sakurapa Dam, also part of another hydro dam that is being um, proposed for removal right now up in Maine. The complicated thing about this is that the site has been so manipulated that removal of the dams alone will still not allow for fish passage. So because they've excavated out a tail race into bedrock and because the channel had been relocated, um, it's gonna have to be both removal of those spillways manipulation of the bedrock itself and um, a fishway put into the tail race. There is just no good way to restore this site after it had been manipulated um, so much in the past. Another example, the, um, a hydro power dam that was uh, removed um, because it was no longer economically feasible because it had to be repaired for seismic and hydraulic deficiencies. So, this one was interesting because basically the dam's down in the lower right hand corner of this picture, but it had a main channel coming in and a tributary channel coming in. And in the main channel, there was so much sediment that it was gonna make it cost prohibitive to remove this dam. But what they basically did creatively is they broke through a ridge line on the main channel that separated the main channel and the tributary, relocated the main channel into the tributary where there was far um, a much smaller amount of impounded sediment um, and basically then stabilized all the impounded sediment in the main channel in place. Um, here's another example of a small dam that we were looking at for the potential for removal, but a few things came up. Um, really, the, the community wanted to keep this dam and had been for decades looking into potentially retrofitting this with hydro and micro hydro at this site. Um, one of the discussions in a panel discussion we had about this is that really were there potential ways to, instead of using this dam for hydro, still remove this dam and put the micro hydro option into closed conduits, uh, water pipes and sewer pipes, um, instead of uh, continuing to impact the river system. Uh, but this dam still remains and primarily because of what I call unicorn habitat. Um, this is kind of a, a centerpiece in the town here, um, and they, they really like the aesthetic and the historic nature of this site. So I think it's unlikely that that dam will ever be removed. And when we talk about historic and sentimental value, again, I refer to this stuff as unicorn habitat. Here's habitat, here's a really creative example of how to deal with this kind of stuff. This is a site, might not look like unicorn habitat to some of you, but for this community it was. So they wanted to maintain the aesthetic of this site, but they wanted to remove this dam. Now, this dam was removed uh, by an engineering firm named CDM, and I love their creative um, approach to this. Basically, in the upper right-hand corner, you can see they breached part of the dam, like a quarter of the width of the dam, and recreated a free-flowing river but they also maintained the rest of the dam, built a trough on top of the dam and pump water up to the trough such that they still have that falling water aesthetic at the site. Um, I think this is, you know, maybe a bit of a maintenance nightmare, but a very creative way to balance the community's concerns um, with historic issues, sentimental and aesthetic value. And then for our last example, uh, before we get into questions, is preparing for unknowns. I'm going to give you that example of a project that really, really surprised me. 
So this was a very small dam. I'm standing at near the dam. It's about a six foot high dam. Um, and it looked straightforward enough, although it did look like the river had been channelized to some degree, it looked straightforward enough. You'd remove this six foot high dam, dewater this impoundment, maybe do some, some river restoration throughout here because it looks like it had been widened and, and channelized. But I thought it was gonna be straightforward enough until one of the local stakeholders came down and showed me this picture. This picture was taken from a very similar angle to where I was standing. And what it shows is them not only, not only did they bulldoze and widen the channel, but they then put in a series, a network of pipes in the bottom of the river. And that is, if you see in the distance there, that is a complete mat of large iron pipes that they put in as a cooling system for a gas pumping station. At the time, it was considered the world's largest radiator. Um, and of course, after the company went out of business and left, this was left in place. So that is now underneath that impoundment. And removal of that dam means taking that entire system out that is in who knows what type of shape uh, and restoring that channel. That dam has still not been removed, obviously. So that's it. That's conclusion of, uh, of my talk. Hopefully I gave you kind of a, a good um, perspective of the different kind of issues that come up in the process we go through for, uh, for dam removal, especially of these, these small dams uh, in the United States. And I think we can go to questions, even though I'm not going to be able to hear them, but I think we're going to be able to type them. Thank you, Laura, and I will give you a phone call now. So I would like to ask all the uh, okay. participants if they can um, type any questions that you may have in the chat function. And then I will uh, read them out loud. Laura will hear me through the phone. Um, so please, if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them uh, in the chat function. And while you do, um, I will uh, ask Laura a question that I have. Um, also, um, uh, as a result of the morning session, this morning we had a session with Pau who said that um, sometimes the social aspects of dam removal can be much harder than the technical aspects. And also you highlighted that the stakeholder participation in the planning phase is also key to, to know, to identify the key issues. So what I'm wondering with all these um, case studies that you showed, if after the dam, the dam was removed, if, the, uh, if there was any monitoring uh, or analyzing of the social aspects afterwards, and maybe you can tell us a bit about this. Yeah, <clears throat> so you're right. The social issues can be very complex on these, and it's amazing because we didn't really study those in engineering school. So it's kind of like trial by fire, learning these things. Um, yeah, there has been some monitoring of that, not a lot. Um, there are a few good papers out there. Um, right now, I can think there's um, one out of a professor from uh, Dartmouth, uh, Frank McGilligan, I thought did a, a good paper looking at the social issues. Um, I know that there is a research group in um, with a few of the universities here in New England that are looking at balancing hydro and um, and removal issues, and they as well are investigating a lot of the social issues. So there are some good papers out there. There is some monitoring done on that, not a lot. Monitoring overall, um, there was a recent study done in America looking at all the monitoring, and only about 9% of dams that are taken out are really rigorously monitored. Um, and of that, it's even a much, much smaller fraction that would look at the social issues. So, so I think, there is some data out there, but it's still pretty spar uh, uh, scarce. Yes, yeah, I think that's the same in Europe, uh, that we're still um, um, looking to collect more evidence of the impacts of a dam removal or the benefits of the dam removal. So um, it's good to share any, any evidence there is or any um, publications that there are. So um, if there are any participants who would like to ask questions, please um, go ahead and <coughs> type them here and I will read them out loud. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at the screen. I see a question coming in 
from Arnaud Kaiser, who says, thank you very much for your interesting cases presented, most of them in the USA. I was wondering what you consider to be the biggest driver of a dam removal project in the USA. Are these single problems on site or more policy driven? Um, I think the, um, you know, I think the drivers first come from policy. I mean, I think we've set up policy and environmental regulation that makes us now consider safety issues and environmental issues and balance these issues. So the very first driver that, that, that really has made a difference in the United States and, and why we've really had a, a, a proactive dam removal uh, movement in the United States for the last 25 years, um, I would say is, is policy. That being said, I think, um, and a lot of these projects are done for environmental reasons. So obviously the environmental issues are a big driver too, but I would still argue that economic issues associated with dam safety and liability and cost of maintenance of a dam are still the, the biggest underlying reasons why structures are selected for removal or why removal is feasible for those structures. So when it's no longer being used and the costs are outweighing the benefits, um, these decision-making um, periods that they have to, these decision points, I think those are really some of the big drivers, these economic drivers. Yeah, thank you. And um, uh, yes, I think uh, the economic driver is often uh, one of the, the, the key drivers uh, in any case. Um, you showed us um, an extensive um, chart flow, basically, of the uh, different phases in dam removal. and and. In the planning and feasibility phase is already quite extensive and it it consists of many steps which also um, um, include costs as I they to even to to uh, monitor the sediment for example or to draw draft the sediment management plan in in your experience um, has it happened that already a lot of investment was done in this planning and feasibility phase and then the removal actually was canceled um, after yes. already uh, some steps were taken. Yeah, uh, there's no question that these, these upfront things are costs and there is no guarantee that uh, dam removal is a feasible option. So if, if the goal is really removal and uh, environmental reasons, uh, you are still, yes, taking a risk and putting money in upfront to determine if that truly is feasible. And that's why you need kind of that more advanced understanding the planning feasibility phase. Because, you know, if I were to guess, I would still say only about 50% or maybe a little bit more than 50% of the dams that we are thinking about removing actually get removed. Um, there are a lot of things that get in the way. Um, they can become cost prohibitive. Um, there can be other issues that come in, infrastructure issues, historic, sentimental, these kind of things. So, so yeah, yeah, um, yeah, we have definitely spent money on projects, including that Green River Dam. The Green River Dams, um, before we got involved in those, there had been 10 years of analysis by other people and the Army Corps. They had spent, I think, close to a million dollars on those projects, and they did not come out. Now that's that's an extreme case. Normally, the feasibility phase is going to be anywhere from ten to uh, maybe eighty thousand dollars. So, oh. depending on what you do. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I'm trying to see if any other questions are now being typed in the uh, chat. Um, so you highlighted that compared to the US, um, the European rivers are highly managed systems and this makes a dam removal project much more complicated. So this this could not exactly be an incentive for European uh, decision makers to start um, doing more dam removals. So what would be your recommendation for Europe in this case? You know, not all of them are going to run into that problem in Europe. There are plenty of places in Europe, and, and surely I've seen good examples in, um, in Portugal um, and in Spain um, and down when I was in Brazil, where, well, not that that's Europe, but where we have, we still really have um, 
river systems underneath the dams and removal of the dam is going to be a little more straightforward. But there are there's no question that in, in some of the more um, developed areas of Europe and, and clearly in the Netherlands uh, is a good example. Um, the systems are so interconnected and so managed that yes, it is going to be a challenge to remove these. But it doesn't mean that it's a challenge that can't be met. It just has to be teamed with a, a new vision that looks for a more sustainable future where we're not passing on these huge price tags to future generations. I mean, people really have to care about that as a goal. Yeah, yeah I like that to have a new vision and that this should be a sustainable future. And um, this is something that especially towards policymakers or decision makers um, um, can be a, you know, an, an attractive idea. Um, so we will, of course, try also in Europe and in different uh, countries here and across uh, the European Union to, to promote such a new vision. Um, I, have a I mean, it's really, it's really kind of unfair that we've managed our systems to the point where future generations are going to have to pay for our decisions. Yes, yeah, yeah, I agree. I have a question coming in um, from Bruno who says, uh, you met cases where the permits have not been given because of the environmental value of the wetlands created by the dam. Um, so conflict between different environmental values. It's actually a question. Okay, so let me, let me read that again. Um, you met cases where the permits have not been given because of the environmental values of the wetlands um, so conflict between the Yes, um, so we have run into cases um, where the dam itself creates an artificial wetland system. Um, and that wetland system now has value. And we have regulations that don't always distinguish between a man-made wetland system versus a natural wetland system. So when we care about the difference between a man-made or a natural system, and many of our regulators do, they tend to be very pro the idea of removing a dam and restoring a more self-sustaining uh, functioning system and, and floodplain wetlands. But that being said, if it's a regulator that is just looking at acreage of wetlands and they're looking at um, man-made systems the same as um, um, natural systems, we have run into regulatory problems where we have not been able to get our permits uh, without mitigation or without something um, because they, they don't want to lose any kind of quantity of, of wetlands. So, so we do run into that. Um, and it really just depends on where we are and who we're working with. All those different local, state, and federal permits that we deal with. Thanks. Um, Todd is asking, uh, how often are the ecological benefits converted to economic benefits for public education and outreach uh, purposes, either before or after removal? How often are the ecological compared to the economic? Economic. Yeah. economic. Um, I would say that in every project, in every project, we're looking at both the environmental benefits and we're looking at the economics of the, of the situation. But that being said, it's a rare case where they actually go in and do an environmental evaluation of the economic environmental benefits. More or less, we talk about the environmental benefits, but then the economics that are prepared are more associated with how much is it gonna be maintained or, or, or repair a dam. And, and we tend to be lacking uh, good data that puts an economic value on those restored uh, ecological functions. So I know there are people working on that right now and there's some data out there, but not, not as much as we need. Um, Giancarlo is saying, thank you, Laura, for your lecture. And he's asking um, if in the USA, dam removal is dealt with at cat catchment scale or at site scale, as in a case-by-case -case, uh, approach? Yeah, so again, that, that depends a lot, like I said in the planning process, if it's a more opportunistic dam removal made on some kind of dam safety decision point or, or a specific group that wants one dam out. 
Um, then it's done very, you know, uh, on a site by site basis. But more and more, we're seeing prioritization and optimization plans where they're looking um, definitely throughout the entire catchment and, um, and, and trying to prioritize the, the best way to, or optimize the best way to uh, which ones should be removed and, and which ones are the higher priority for that. So, so we're seeing a combination of both. It depends on where you are and which groups you're working with. Yeah. So it could also happen that uh, the ecologic and geomorphic studies are done at basin scale and then the feasibility will be checked at the single dam scale. That, that, so sorry, repeat that, that the... That the ecologic and geomorphic studies, that they are done at yeah. the scale and then the feasibility will be at the single dam scale. Yeah, yeah, so, so you're right. So even on the ones that aren't done in a planning way from a catchment point of view, um, when you're assessing a single dam, um, yeah, clearly on certain things like sensitivity of a system, um, hydrology, flood impacts, you, you have to look at the entire system. Yeah, yeah. Also, when you're talking about uh, uh, consecutive dams and the impacts of one dam removal. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You have to... on, the, on the others. Yes, exactly. Yeah. There, would, there would be no way really to look at, like we said, uh, a canal-based system that had been so highly manipulated uh, and just try to look at that one site, you, you would have to look at how it's connected to everything else. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, I think this was the last question that we had today. Um, I see no other Excellent. questions coming in. So, Laura, I would like to thank you for the extensive presentation and all the case studies that you presented. Uh, and, all, and a big thank you also to the participants who have been here today and who gave us some questions. Um, please note that the slides and the video will be uploaded to the Wetlands International uh, website later on. Um, and I would like to invite you to, um, to come and to download it there. And also, if you have any um, uh, anything, any questions or, or any information which you would like to share with us, please uh, uh, do so. We always welcome any feedback or any uh, additional information that we have overlooked so far. So we, w we invite everyone to, to, um, uh, to join the discussion on this topic. Um, this uh, webinar was the last one before Christmas. In January, we will have two other webinars coming up um, about two other related topics. So please, uh, join us uh, then and um, well we're looking forward to seeing you there um, thank you and uh, have a good good day bye bye everyone thanks a lot